hi everyone welcome to another episode of bibliophiles this is the program on aadl tv where each episode we talk about one book topic so each of us picks book a book or books that fall into that topic my name is lucy and as usual i'm here with christopher and amanda and our topic for today is a little bit different we are pairing two books so we each had to pick a fiction and a non-fiction book to pair and talk about. So I will be interested to see what we came up with. Amanda, what did you choose? All right, so when I was trying to think of books to pick for this, I haven't read a lot of good nonfiction lately or nonfiction in general, that's not my my category, but there was a nonfiction book that I read last year that I thought would be fun to mention because I figure some people have probably heard about it even if they haven't read it. And that is a book by Chuck Klosterman called The 90s. Um, So this author, he's very well known, popular. Um, I don't read a lot of historical fiction or nonfiction that's based on history. Those are just not my category. So today I decided, hey, why not? This is what we're doing. Um, So he's got a couple of fiction books he's written and several nonfiction books. And a lot of it, a lot of them I take are similar where they cover a lot of pop culture and historical events, politics, um, and they're funny. So, and this one is, that but it covers just the decade of the 90s the 1990s what was happening um so the book it's not written chronologically he just mentions different topics and then writes essays about them it's basically a collection of essays where he just discusses uh, things that were happening politically cultural in the 90s it's not it's a there's a lot of objective stuff but there are some personal notes in there and it's definitely when you're reading it it's written he is a middle-class white male, so it's definitely written through that lens. And it doesn't detract from the book, but it's just something that you kind of notice as you're reading it. There's definitely some, like, especially pop cultural things, like things that were music or television, things that were going on that weren't quite, that are things that are left out. But again, it's not all-inclusive. The 90s is a mammoth decade. And if you're a historian wanting to cover every topic, you're, it's not possible. Um, but he covers what he wants to talk about. And he mentions lots of things. Um, there's At the beginning, there's a lot of talk about Nirvana. And for me, I was like, oh, cool. Yes, please talk about Nirvana. But then I was like, wait, why are we still talking about Nirvana? Um, so it's, it was kind of fun, though. And I, I listened to this book on audio. Nonfiction works really well on audio for me. And I had a lot of fun listening to it. Again, this is my first Colsterman. I don't read a lot of historical stuff. So I thought it was fun. Um, I turned 14 in the year 1990, and then I graduated from college in 99. So between those ages, like 14 to 25, I was just like old enough and cool enough to think I knew a lot of stuff, but I didn't because I was still, you know, in formation at that point. But it was still, I was old enough to like understand or like remember a lot of the things that were happening, although not at the same level I might now. So I had a lot of fun with the book. Um, I'm not going to sit back and read all of his books. But for me, just reading this one about the 90s was a lot of fun. Um, some parts he did drone on a little bit, like the Nirvana got along. Like when he was talking about some of the sports events, I was just kind of like tapped out or he went on and on about the internet, which I guess is relevant because it was a big thing in the 90s. Um, but the, some long chapters where again, audiobooks really saved me on that. So anyways, that is a uh, very, very quick blurb, the 90s by Chuck Posterman. I had a lot of fun with it. I recommend it. Um, and then... And thinking of a fiction book to pair it with, I decided to pick a book that was set in the 90s. And this book came up when I was trying to pick an adult fiction. And this book popped up and I just thought it would be a a nice little one to pair with it. And it's a middle grade fiction book called Playing Atari with Saddam Hussein, based on a true story. And it's by Jennifer Roy and Ali Fadil. And Ali is actually the young boy that's in this book. So this is a middle grade fiction. It is was published in 2018 and it's a slim book. It covers, it's set in January, 1991 when Operation Desert Storm starts and Ali is the one who is narrating the book. And it's through his perspective of being in his house with his family, trying to basically it covers the 43 days of Operation Desert Storm. And his family is well off. They live in a big house. His mother is a, is a, professor and his father is a dentist and he's living in this house with his mother his older brother and then his three younger siblings and he is obsessed with america he loves video games he watches television he reads superman comics um he he actually is he does really well in his english classes at school 
So for him, he's just obsessed with America. But it's a really, really interesting and neat point of view of this 11 year old in this situation, seeing what's happening outside of his window, being in the safe room with his family. So it's a very young perspective. Um, there's not a ton of pop culture stuff because you are discussing a war through the eyes of an 11 year old. So some of the things he mentions are are pretty cute. So there's not quite a, as much pop culture stuff as you would with the, the Klosterman 90s books. Um, but this book is the 43 days. The first couple of weeks are, he goes into more detail and the last two weeks are shorter chapters. And then it flashes forward to 14 years later and our young Ali, he's in his mid twenties and he is now a translator and he is actually part of the team that's working the um, the trial of Saddam Hussein when he was being tried for a prosecutor for crimes against humanity. So it kind of has this full circle effect that I thought was really cool. Um, the author, Jennifer Roy, her sister-in-law, or his sister-in-law, when he was in the trial, the prosecuting, one of the prosecuting attorneys for Saddam Hussein, his sister-in-law is the author of this book. So that was the connection that he was able to make. So I just thought that was really cool to, to see that perspective kind of during the war and then to see where he landed afterwards. And eventually he ended up moving to the United States. Um, but I had a lot, the book was, I really, really enjoyed the book. I read it in one sitting. Um, yeah, I just thought it was a really, really, really good book. And I do recommend it. Um, and again, it's only 1991 and it's the one small bit of something that happened in the 90s. But I thought it was a good pairing for someone who reads middle grade nonfiction. Anyway, so those are the two books I picked. Um, playing Atari with Saddam Hussein and the 90s by Chuck Klosterman. Um, Christopher, what books did you pair? Well, first, I just want to say that sounds like a really cool pairing. I also searched for a long time to see what I would put together. And I finally landed on the idea of bi-coastal cities. So a book set in New York and one set in San Francisco. Up first is Roaming by Jillian and Mariko Tamaki. Uh, this is a graphic novel, and it's a fictionalized account of a trip that several friends take to New York City, a city that they've always wanted to go to. So these are three 19-year-olds, so really on the cusp of adulthood and trying to figure out who they are and trying out uh, kind of their future personalities to some extent. Two of the friends are old friends from high school, and one brings her new college friend into the mix. So I really love the personalities here and the the changes that everyone is going through. It seemed very realistic to me, the, the kind of tiffs and the personality clashes and the kind of romantic interests that are involved with this uh, th group of three people. The art is great. I really have to point out this beautiful image of the Flatiron Building. It's such a great shot. And uh, there are many, many other wonderful shots in the book. So I had just been in New York, and I think it really captures a lot of the New York spirit. The other book I read, which is nonfiction, is my first Rebecca Solnit book, Reflections of My Non-Existence. Wow. Her writing is exquisite. I absolutely adore how her, her breadth of knowledge. She pulls in so many different threads from mythology, artists, history, place, the environment. Uh, it was just fascinating to read her work. The reason this is so based in San Francisco is because for 25 years, she had the same apartment in the panhandle in the city. And she writes lovingly about all the walks that she took and her neighborhood and all the changes that took place. The book is called Reflections of My Non-Existence because she also goes into detail about what it means to be a woman and to be non-existent in so many different spheres of life. She was 
non-existent in the publishing world when people tried to deny that she knew what she was talking about. She's non-existent in conversations when people don't trust her viewpoint. She's non-existent physically when she's on the the on public transportation and people are trying to crowd her and on and on and on. Uh, the book spans a lot of different topics, but I so loved her descriptions of her San Francisco neighborhood. And uh, that's my pairing, these bi-coastal cities. So I uh, loved them both. Lucy, what did you pick? Um, bef I, before I start, I just want to say I just brought Roaming Home from the library for the second time. I'm so excited oh. now. I'm like really motivated to read it. And um, with Rebecca Solnit, you have no, there's no small amount for you to dive into now if you find you like her because she's she's really a prolific and great writer. Um, so yeah, anyway, what I picked for um, nonfiction and fiction pairing, the nonfiction book I picked, I don't have to hold up because I read it um, as an ebook, but it is called How Far the Light Reaches, A Life in 10 Sea Creatures by Sabrina Imbler. Um, and Sabrina Imbler is a science writer. They are looking at their life. They're tracing parts of their life through these 10 essays. Each one is starts about a sea creature, um, but the author also pulls in things from their personal life. So it's sort of this weave of like marine science and biology and then these really deeply personal anecdotes um and they're they're a beautiful writer they write so knowledgeably and carefully and caringly about the the sea creatures but then you're also learning about all these different um facets of their their life and so the personal essay and the marine biology like they really complement each other very well here it's almost as if looking at something larger like this deep sea creature can help somebody contextualize what's going on in their own life or even a more social situation that's bigger than them um so in looking at each one of these creatures Imbler also kind of explores their relationships their their relationship with gender um it's this um like a celebration of their, their queerness and looking more deeply at the queer community. And they get into discussing their mixed race identity. Um, and then they also have a mixed race partner. So they're looking at that personally and they're looking at it through their partner. And yet somehow really blending this so well with this really interesting uh, fact-filled essays about these creatures which is something i love like i love nature books that tell me lots of interesting facts and lots of weird things about animals deep under the sea and then i also just love personal essays like this so this combination of things really made this one of my favorite books that i read in this last year uh, and it pairs really naturally with a fiction book i read a ya book which is called man a war and this is by corey mccarthy and this is a book that centers on a character named River McIntyre and River lives in a really small conservative town in Ohio. The one thing that this town has going for it is this like huge marine complex, kind of like SeaWorld, you know, that's like the big attraction in this town and it's called Sea Planet. Um, River at this, River's a competitive swimmer and swimming is a lot of this book. So there's like a, big relationship to water um and at the beginning of the book river is in a relationship with another girl and her girlfriend taylor river's girlfriend is like a very binary lesbian she just thinks that there can be like straight people and there can be gay people and she's really outspoken about it and she's really like uh vocal about it in a very public space and she's transphobic and she's biphobic and this has really been river's introduction to to being in a queer relationship and being a queer person so that's sort of what river's taken on and then river meets this um 
person named Indigo who comes to work at Sea Planet where River works. And Sea Planet is out, they're proud, they're agender. River knew them when they were a child, but now they're re-meeting them. And through a relationship with Indigo, River starts to figure out some things about themselves. Um, first of all, having to do with their gender, that they are not female, maybe not even uh, non-binary, maybe even trans. And so that's sort of a journey that River goes on through the book and then um, has to really get over all this internalized homophobia and this gender dysphoria. And what's interesting is as River gets more language around all these different um, facets of queer life, River is allowed to know more about themselves. So language is really key here. And another way that language comes through really beautifully in this book is that River is obsessed with sea creatures and um, probably more than anything, a man of war. So this book is divided up in these chapters or these segments and each chapter is named after another sea animal like seahorses or penguins or octopuses or blackfish. So it's like <laughs> very, very similar to the nonfiction book I talked about. And what Corey McCarthy does in this book that I love so much is that has the author has River tell you about um, a sea animal, but in a way that they're comparing it to their own life. And these little snippets, like this is the one for Man of War, which is the book they are, the, the book's name ever. You can see it's just like a little bit of a page of, um, of how they're relating Man of War. And also they're looking at animals in captivity because they work at Sea Planet. So there's a whole piece about that too, like what that does to animals. And I just want to share the Man of War one because they're just, I just loved these. So um, it says, by nature, Man of Wars are gorgeous masculine fellows. They're also known as blue bottles because of their jeweled translucent sail. They reproduce however they want with whomever they want. Sometimes they do it all by themselves. They can submerge to avoid predators or capture large marine life with their retractable tentacles. By nature, they are, they are all there are too often socialized female to the point of venomousness. Captivity will kill them as they're meant to exist upon a natural tide, not bound to antiquated commercial gender roles. Approach with affirmation and love. And so that's just an example of how River is looking at this, uh, you know, this creature in the sea that they love, but also using it to contextualize their own experience, which is exactly what Imbler was doing in How Far the Light Reaches. And so that is my nonfiction and fiction pairing, How Far the Light Reaches by Sabrina Imbler and Man of War by Corey McCarthy. Uh, does anyone have any final thoughts about pairing books together? Um, and if not, we would always love to hear from you about books that you are reading, whether it's a great nonfiction book you read or fiction or how you connect books in your mind. So please feel free to send us a comment about that. And we will see you on the next episode of Bibliophiles. Thanks.